Two girls, ages 11 and 13, are suing the county for allegedly taking their money while they were in the foster system. A jury is deliberating in former KUSI anchor Sandra Moss's equal pay lawsuit against the station. 14-year-old Mario just recovered from a heart transplant and he has big dreams to get back on the basketball court. We have his miraculous story. California ranks number one for horse lovers. We'll tell you why. And when an El Cajon family with 18 adopted children needed help, Rebuilding Together San Diego came knocking. CBS 8 News Live at 6 starts now. A new lawsuit accuses the county of illegally taking money from two sisters who were in foster care. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. I'm Marcella Lee. The county doesn't deny taking the money, adding it believes everything it did was legal under state law. CBS 8 Steve Price takes a closer look at the lawsuit and explains why the girls and their adoptive parents believe this case could help hundreds of children in a similar situation. This is a new lawsuit filed against the County of San Diego. The plaintiffs, two sisters, ages 11 and 13. Their attorney says the county illegally took their money while they were in the foster system. Money they were getting from the federal government because their dad died. I can't think of any greater harm that a city or a county or the state can do than to uh, bezel money from foster children. Attorney Robert Felmuth is a professor at USD and founder of the Children's Advocacy Institute, which works to improve the lives of kids in the foster care system. He says this type of thing has been going on all over the country for years. That money should go into a trust fund, which should be available to the child at, at when the child gets out at 18 to 21 so they can get a car to get to work, so they can go to college. They can do all sorts of things they need to do uh, to become uh, viable and self-sufficient. Falmouth is one of the attorneys who filed the lawsuit, which claims the county received and spent all or substantially all of plaintiff's Social Security survivors' benefits on what it describes as placement costs, despite the fact that federal, state, and county sources already appropriate money to defendant for the care and maintenance of foster children like plaintiffs. They take the money and then they embezzle it. They take all this money and they spend it stick it back into the general fund. We love those girls. Amy asked us not to use her last name to protect the girls who she fostered and then adopted. She assumed the county was putting their money in a trust fund, but when she inquired about it, she says the county gave her the runaround. I was very confused and also very upset. Amy contacted Falmouth leading to the lawsuit. These kids are due $25,000 in survivor benefits. And they, they, one's 11, one's 13, and they're getting nothing. A county spokesperson sent CBS 8 a statement saying they ended their policy of taking Social Security money from children in the foster system in March of 2022, adding, currently, if the county is the payee to the survivor's benefits, the county maintains a reserve account for the youth until the youth reaches 18 years of age, exits foster care, or there is a new representative payee. At that point, the benefits will be returned to Social Security, who will then send payments to the current representative payee and or youth. But Amy hasn't seen any accounts from the county that show money for her girls. And now she's supporting a fight in Sacramento to change state law. They're hoping a new bill will be introduced in the next few weeks. Even if the kids don't get those funds back, our intention is to, as a family, the four of us, my husband and the two girls, we've sat down and we said, if we can change the course for other kids that go into Child Protective Services, that's the ultimate goal here for us. In Kearney Mesa, Steve Price, CBS 8. Thanks, Steve. A woman who was voted one of the top five teachers of the year in San Diego County is out on bail tonight. She is accused of having an inappropriate relationship with a 13 year old former student. 34 year old Jacqueline Ma is a sixth grade teacher at Lincoln Acres Elementary in National City. She was arrested yesterday after National City Police say they were contacted by the student's parent. Ma is facing felony charges of sexual misconduct with a minor. Parents are meeting right now at the National School District office and we're there. We'll bring you that part of the story at 10 and 11. A man accused of shooting and killing a teenager in Chicano Park has pleaded guilty. 32 year old Bryant Ruiz is facing a 26 year sentence for voluntary manslaughter. Prosecutors say Ruiz shot and killed 15 year old Brian Romo back in October of 2020 in retaliation for the murder of one of his fellow gang members. 
Ruiz, who was on parole, was wearing a GPS ankle monitor. He was tracked going from his home to the scene of the shooting. A jury began deliberating today after hearing closing arguments in former news anchor Sandra Moss's civil lawsuit against KUSI TV. Those closing arguments wrapped up three weeks of testimony where Moss's attorneys argued the TV station paid her less than her male counterpart, even though she did the same work. CBS 8 has been on top of this case from the start. Jesse Pagan is here for our continued coverage. Jesse. Yeah, guys, our team inside the courtroom today said the courtroom was truly packed with supporters for both sides. Moss's attorney kicked off the closing arguments today saying the case isn't just about her but employees everywhere. This is an important case. This is a case that screams out for punitive damages. Sandra Moss's attorney started by saying the case is about the principles of gender discrimination, equal pay and retaliation, which many of us are familiar with these days. But what we haven't seen, what goes unsaid in the headlines is just how deeply rooted those problems are in the corporations in this country and in this corporation. Moss is accusing KUSI of gender and age discrimination and violating California's Equal Pay Act. She and her lawyers argued KUSI didn't renew her contract in 2019 because she spoke up about the difference in salary between her and co-anchor Alan Denton. Over the past three weeks, we've learned Moss made $90,000 less than Denton at one point. That gap did get smaller as the years went on. The law requires equal pay for equal work when there is equal merit. Here, there was not equal merit. KUSI's attorneys argued Moss didn't get paid as much as Denton because she didn't work as much and wasn't as good. They also say she was a disgruntled employee, using a clip of her making a comment off air. I hate this place. Alan Denton was the more experienced anchor. He was the more highly decorated anchor. He was the more accomplished journalist. He was the more talented anchor in the judgment of KUSI's news director. Moss wants $10 million in damages. The jury already went home for the day. They'll pick this back up tomorrow. The jurors, they have a lot of information and testimony to go through. But our team in the courtroom today says they got the sense the judge wants the jury to come to their decision sooner than later. Marcella. All right, we'll stay on top of the story. Thanks for that update, Jesse. A new first today in San Diego's fight against the opioid crisis. The county has installed its first vending machine to put the life-saving overdose medication naloxone into the hands of any Anyone who wants or needs it free of charge. This machine is at the McAllister South Bay Regional Recovery Center. That's in Chula Vista. And the county says you don't have to be a member of the center to use it. San Bernardino County officials say snow has been removed from 90% of the roads there. More relief is also on the way to people who have been stranded in mountain communities since the latest winter storm. And as Nicole Comstock reports, at least one death is being blamed on the storms. A dark cloud is finally starting to lift over the San Bernardino Mountains. And as the snow continues to melt, you can see more of the damage it caused in Crestline. We found a handful of businesses with massive holes knocked into the roofs, some from the weight of the snow, others from falling trees. This building looks more like it took a direct hit from a tornado. We have more text messages than we could possibly read. There's like 150 calls up in Cedar Pines Park. Christopher Woodbridge and his friend Zachary Party are some of the unsung heroes of this unprecedented snowstorm. A lot of people don't feel safe right now. They're helping their neighbors in town feel a little bit safer during this emergency. They rented this loader last week, and ever since, they've been working up to 18 hours a day moving snow. Moving everybody's berms, taking cars out, clearing roads, clearing paths helping people get out of their homes. All because they want their communities to recover just a little bit quicker. So we have crews aggressively going after reported natural gas leaks in conjunction with Southern California Gas Company. During their latest briefing, the San Bernardino County Fire Department asked residents who can to clear the gas meters around their homes as they're still battling structure fires. Sheriff's deputies went door to door to deliver boxes of food to people who still can't get out. And the Valley of Enchantment Fire Department set up this food distribution table outside the station. While the sheriff is reporting 11 deaths during the storm, he says that only one of them was storm related. The other 10, he says, were people under medical care. One family tells us their 93 year old aunt died alone in her home without power, telephone service and with little food. 
But many residents say they've seen more help arriving this week. I mean, the county's doing their job the best they can. Just It's just difficult because there's nowhere to put the snow anywhere. Nicole Comstock reporting. Now, the family of that 93-year-old woman who died told Kate CBS they did call emergency services several times trying to find someone to go and rescue her, but they say they never has received any help. Still ahead tonight, a teenager with big basketball dreams is on the rebound after a life-threatening scare. Plus, the local Olympian who's breaking barriers as a firefighter on this International Women's Day. We had cool temps out there with a cool breeze, and by tomorrow, slightly warmer temperatures, and then we're gearing up for a couple of atmospheric river events. We'll go ahead and take a look at your complete forecast coming up. Top leaders at the FBI, CIA, and other intelligence agencies share the biggest global dangers facing the U.S. I'm Nicole D'Antonio on Capitol Hill with who and what they believe to be the greatest worldwide threat.